Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Airplane Anatomy, a series where I break down different badass planes from their history to their engineering to how they fly. And today on episode 16, we'll be talking about a plane that has actually been around for a while, but has more recently dominated every single news headline around the world. No, not the Bezos rocket, that's another video. No, we're talking about the C-17 Globemaster III. Now you might know it as the heroine that brought 800 and 23 Afghans to safety during the Kabul evacuation. But a little less known is the fact that it's actually been breaking records left and right for a few decades prior. Now the C-17 is one of the largest cargo aircraft in the US Air Force. It's used to carry missiles, tanks, planes, paratroopers, and even presidential limousines. Now, despite its enormous size, the C-17 is incredibly nimble and capable of short takeoffs and landings from makeshift airstrips. So today, we're going to be talking in detail about this gentle giant of the skies, including why it was nearly canceled right after its maiden flights, also its engineering secrets that make it extremely maneuverable. And of course, lastly, we're going to be going over the unknown challenges that pilots had to face during Kabul's record-breaking evacuation. So let's get started. The story of the C-17 starts back in the 1970s. As the Vietnam War was winding down, America was entering into a more peaceful era. And around the same time, the US Air Force was also looking for a newer replacement of the cargo aircraft it had been using for around two decades during the Vietnam War. These include the C-141 Starlifter and the C-130 Hercules. So the Air Force decided to hold an advanced medium short takeoff and landing transport competition for companies to submit proposals for this new plane. Did anybody tell the Air Force you don't need to fit every single requirement into the name of your competition? I mean, imagine if Miss America pageant was instead named the pretty girl who looks nice in a bikini and can solve world hunger contest just doesn't have a ring to it. Both Boeing and McDonnell Douglas submitted planes for this contest that exceeded every single requirement set by the Air Force. Boeing's prototype was named the YC-14 and McDonnell Douglas the YC-15, or what would eventually become, spoiler alert, the C-17. But not so fast, because the Air Force decided to cancel the contest before a winner was chosen. Kind of like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas decided to spend a million dollars buying lottery tickets, then finding out the next day the lottery was canceled. But a decade later, in the 80s, the Air Force decided to bring back the program, but asked for an even larger and more powerful plane. Now, McDonnell Douglas decided to revive their old submission, the YC-15, but made a few improvements to it, like a more aerodynamic swept back wing, more powerful engines, and of course, a larger size. And hence was born the C-17, which took its first flight in 1991. But almost immediately after this maiden flight, the entire production once again came very close to being shut down. In fact, the program was over budget and the plane couldn't meet the weight, fuel burn, payload, or range specifications, and it was just about failing every single airworthiness test with flying colors. As a result, the Air Force cut their original 210 aircraft order down by almost half to just 120. In 1993, an ultimatum was given to McDonnell Douglas, either resolve the production and budget issues in two years, or the program is going to be terminated after the 40th aircraft. And in the end, it turns out that the complexities of rocket science was no match for the threat of financial ruin from the government. Because just months away from this deadline in 1995, McDonnell Douglas solved all their design problems and full production began. And as it turns out, there was really no need to worry about sales because after the demonstrated success and reliability of the C-17, the US Air Force, along with eventually eight other operators, ended up placing more orders for the aircraft with a total of 279 models ever built. It was also during this time that the C-17 earned its name, the Globe Master III, the third of a line of Douglas heavy cargo airlifters named Globemasters. 
and more informally, it also has the nickname the moose from the sound of the air venting during refueling on the ground, which allegedly sounds like a moose bellowing. <laughs> The C-17 is designed to carry extremely heavy payloads over very long distances and land in very difficult terrain. Now, To achieve this, the aircraft is an absolute giant, and I know it's hard to picture this, but here it is making an M1 battle tank look dainty in comparison. The plane is 53 meters in length, almost twice the length of H-737, and around the same wingspan from wingtip to wingtip. It can carry up to 170,000 pounds of cargo, or that's about the same weight of two unloaded 737s. Now, despite this enormous size, the C-17s are designed to be incredibly nimble and take off and land from very short airstrips. That's mostly thanks to its four Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines, which are militarized versions of the same engines used on the Boeing 757. But what's special about the design of the engines on the C-17 is that the engine exhaust is directed onto large flaps on the wings that extend down into the exhaust stream. This additional air that's being pushed over the flaps generates additional lift. Now this allows the aircraft to fly very steep approaches at relatively low landing speeds. These are essentially supersized versions of the same flaps that we see extend during landings. So remember, just like Texas, everything is bigger on the C-17. The engines also use thrust reversers that direct exhaust upwards and forwards from the back of the engine. This not only allows the aircraft to taxi backwards, but also reduces the risk of debris from entering the engines. This is especially important when the aircraft is operating in unpaved fields or makeshift airstrips. And even the landing wheels on the C-17 have a special design. They first will deploy sideways before rotating 90 degrees to line up with the plane's centerline. Now this is both to help save space that's needed for the wheel well during flights, and also the wheel's ability to pivot helps with its turning radius while on the ground. With this design, this enormous plane can make an 180 degree turn in just 80 feet or 24 meters. I probably need more than that to turn a bumper car. The C-17 can take off and land on runways at least 3,500 feet in length and can stop fully loaded in as few as 2,000 feet. Now, I know it's kind of hard to understand just how impressive that is, but take for example the 747, which is a plane just slightly heavier fully loaded than the C-17, but requires runways at least double that length. But okay, I'll stop comparing C-17s to airliners because it's just not a fair fight. But one place where airliners do have the upper hand is speed, because in exchange for all that heavy lifting, C-17s only have a maximum speed of Mach 0.74, which means it will often get passed by the tourists on their way to Paris. So next, let's talk about the C-17 in action. The first C-17 was delivered in 1993, and since then it has been serving a variety of roles, from transporting troops and cargo, to low altitude airdrops, to medical evacuations, and many more. And a very special role that the C-17 serves is as a support aircraft that follows the president as he or she travels around the world. This plane is used to transport the presidential limousine, the presidential helicopter, also known as Marine One, and various other support equipment and crew that the president needs. Now, at some points, the president has even flown on this support C-17, temporarily earning it the call sign Air Force One. In another special mission performed by the C-17 are annual trips to Antarctica, where it delivers supplies and personnel as a part of the U.S. Antarctic Research Program. For most missions, the C-17 requires a crew of at least three, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the loadmaster. What a cool job title. So what do you do? Oh, me, I'm a loadmaster. Oh, it's my nickname every Thanksgiving. 
Now, the loadmaster has many roles. For example, navigating the aircraft when it's reversing on the ground, communicating between the pilots and the troops in the back, but most importantly, loading and unloading the plane's cargo. Now, this is more than just plain missile Jenga, because how the weight of the cargo is distributed affects how the plane flies. If the load is too heavy at the front, the plane might not be able to lift its nose off the ground. And if the back of the plane is too heavy, that might cause the aircraft to stall right after takeoff. So for this reason, it's really important that the loadmaster distributes the weight of the cargo as closely around the plane's center of gravity as possible. And another thing you might have noticed about the C-17 is that it's not exactly a stealthy plane. So for this reason, in order to avoid detection, C-17 pilots often fly the plane as close to the ground as possible, often as low as 1,000 feet. And if it really gets itself into trouble, they are also equipped with magnesium flares to distract heat-seeking infrared-guided missiles or some fireworks shows for when the pilots get bored. And get bored they will, because C-17s can often serve on missions spanning several days without rest. And with its aerial refueling capabilities, it can technically stay in the air forever. That is, until the crew complains. C-17s were so successful in operation that it was later purchased by eight other air forces and are still widely used around the world today. More recently, it has been closely compared with its European rival, the Airbus A400M Atlas, a more modern four-engine turboprop transport aircraft that came out in 2009. And with newer contenders entering the race, Boeing decided in 2013 that it would produce the very last C-17 Globemaster III, with a total of 279 planes produced. And lastly, of course, we need to talk about Reach 871, the mission that flew 640 Afghans and 183 children to safety during Kabul's evacuation. And this is the largest evacuation flight for the C-17, beating its previous record of 670 people evacuated during a 2013 typhoon in the Philippines. Adding to the challenge of taking off with a literal mob on the runway, the pilots didn't know exactly how many passengers they had in the back. They didn't know how much weight they were actually carrying and hence how much runway they needed to take off. A conservative estimate of 800 passengers at 200 pounds each would put the cargo at around 160,000 pounds, which is dangerously close to the plane's limits. On top of that, Kabul sits at an altitude of around 5,900 feet, where the air is pretty thin to begin with, and together with a hot climate, that makes it even worse. So all of these factors together drastically reduces the lift that the aircraft is able to produce. Surround so that with some mountainous terrain and you have an incredible challenge. And that was just one of the hundreds of flights that C-17s and other aircraft are making to bring people to safety. So with this video, I hope I can make whatever minuscule contribution I can to bring to life the story of this incredible plane and more importantly, the brave men and women behind it that make all of this happen. So that's a little overview of the C-17 Globemaster III. Were there anything that I mentioned during this video that was surprising about the airplane? When I was researching this plane, I was not expecting this absolute roller coaster of a backstory. Stip stop, stip stop, stip stop. But I really enjoyed making this one and I hope you guys enjoyed watching as well. As always, if you made it this far, consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel for new content like this. But that's it from me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Transport competition for companies to submit their claims. No. Now both Boeing and McDonnell Douglas submitted claims for... <sighs> claims, this is not insurance. <laughs> Spoiler alerts, the... What plane am I talking about?